That's a good question. I, you know, I've got, I've done so many of these interviews, Sydney, and I thought I'd been asked every question under the sun, but you win. I have not been asked that question. I am the nosiest person who's ever interviewed you. No, it's just a great question. I have to really think. The proceeds of this monetized episode are going towards I Am Dying Out Loud. Find out more in the description. Dave Warnock, thank you so much for joining me on Growing Up Fundy. I really, really appreciate your time and your your patience. You waited 15 minutes for me, which I really appreciate. Um, so I initially found your bio on the list of speakers for the SSA conference in Missouri. But then as I was reading more about your work and, and I saw some links to speeches you had given or were about to give, I just thought your story was absolutely fascinating. And I was just curious to hear more about uh, where you've come from and, and where you're going from you yourself. Sure. Happy to. Glad to be here. It's great to have you. So you, we found out that you grew up in Arkansas, very similar to me. Is that where you were born or did you move there at some point when you were younger? No, I was born in Great Britain. Oh, um, wow. my, dad, my father was in the Air Force, so I was a military brat, moved around a lot. Um, lived several places before I moved to Arkansas when I was about 10. And Interesting. Uh, I didn't actually grow up fundy. I, yeah. uh, I came into it uh, in the Jesus movement in the 70s. So I, I, I wasn't indoctrinated. I did it willingly. I have no excuses. <laughs> but that's like, that's what's so fascinating to me is like you, you took yourself there. So how old were you the first time that you were exposed to fundamentalist or evangelical ideas? Um, I, I have vague memories of being dropped off at a church here and there. My mom would try to get a little goodness in us, I think, um, me and my two brothers. Um, I went to vacation Bible school at, at least yep. one summer yep. to, to a, a Baptist down in a little town called Garfield, Arkansas, outside Rogers. Yep. And uh, none of that, you know, made much impact. Um, but then I, uh, my brother, when my older brother, a year older, went away to college uh, when I was a senior in high school and, um, he got caught up in the Jesus movement. This was 1972. Interesting to most people, I feel like leave it in college, but he found it in college. He found it. And, um, so he started influencing me and I blame him. I blame him. Did Uh, he go to a religious university or was it just there in the area? School and he got caught up in the Jesus movement. I mean that, you know, Jesus Christ, superstar, Godspell. Um, the Duber brothers were singing Jesus is just all right with me. Norman Greenbaum was singing Spirit in the Sky. This was a cultural thing that was happening. Jesus was on the cover of Time magazine. This wasn't yeah. some background thing. It was it was a big deal in the, in the nation. And so I just got swept up in it at the age of 18 yeah. right out of high school. Yeah. I mean, it's easy to do. It's easy yeah. to do. And were you still in the South at that point? You're still in Arkansas? I wasn't. I graduated high school in Rogers, and then my parents had moved to Texas um, by then, and I was going to sit out a year of college, or sit out a year and then save money for college, and so I went to live with them to save money for that, and then they were in Texas, so um, I happened to be living in Texas at the time that Jesus found me, and so it was uh, the winter of 1973. And was that where your brother was as well? Is that where he found it too? No. Or? no, he was in Arkansas, but he was home for Christmas and he drug me to a Bible study. And and uh, that experience is captured in vivid detail in my memoir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I am so, I was so excited when I saw you wrote a memoir because I was like, man, this is so great. This is awesome. And so mm-hmm. just like out of curiosity, were you a Rogers Mountie? Did you go to that Rogers High School? Did you Not see me. they took the, the pipe away from the Mountie a few years back? Did they really? Because it promoted smoking. <laughs> oh my God, you're kidding me. Yeah, yeah my the senior year of high school, they got rid of it. The yeah. corn cob pipe? Oh yeah. man. 
Did yep. you go to Rogers High too? I went to Bentonville High. Oh, that's right. Bentonville. Yeah, but I remember when that happened, it was a big deal. Our, so yeah, our- when you, so you're introduced to this idea, this like Jesus movement, were your parents concerned at all with how um, kind of like charismatic the whole thing was or were they into it? No, they were not religious at all. They were um, really, uh, it, it was overwhelming to them because I mean, I would literally go in my closet and pray because that's what Jesus said to do. And we were speaking in tongues and carrying big Bibles around and every, you know, big crosses around our necks. And they didn't quite know what to make of us. Right. Um, it's my like mom, the opposite said, of a teenage rebellion. Exactly. And, and we're just a little bit, you know, like, aren't you going to go get an education, Dave? And nope, I got to follow Jesus. I've got to do coffee houses and street ministry and stuff like that. That's wild. That's yeah. wild. And so where did you think that was going to take you at the time? Because I know that you were eventually a pastor, right? Was that kind of the idea the whole time or? No, I didn't have any plans. I I figured Jesus was coming back in a couple of years at the most. But don't we all? I, don't we all? True, I did. I thought, it, I don't need to go to college. What's the point of getting an education and having a career? Because it's all going to be over in a few years. And so. Um, let me win as many people to Jesus as I can. And so I just got, people started telling me I was anointed and filled with the spirit and called to be a minister. And so I started doing that kind of thing. And it wasn't a a steady arc of a career in ministry. It was some years I'd be in ministry on, on, on staff at a church. And then other years I would be doing my own business or working somewhere else. It was a very irregular and uh, unorthodox approach to ministry. But I was always involved in ministry, whether it was being paid as a staff member or volunteering in some way. I was always involved in leadership because I felt like God had called me to that. Right. Yeah. And like and that's a real thing. I I think people who didn't grow up in that kind of background or ever really experienced something like that, they don't understand how powerful that draw is or that call to do whatever it is you're called to do. I remember I was 10 when I felt that calling. Like it's when it hits, it hits. So then did you stay in Texas or did the calling end up taking you elsewhere? Or how did that work before you became like a, a pastor of your own church? Um, yeah, I never did actually lead my own church. I was always an associate pastor. But um, no, I didn't stay in Texas very long. I I'd opened a coffee house there and did that for a couple of years. And then I, I felt led to move to Arkansas where my brother was um, and get involved with the church that he was in there. And that's where I was when I met my wife and got married, started having kids. I, I, you know, I did, I did jobs there that were, I, I knew I needed to, you know, raise a family and pay bills. So I got jobs and eventually I was brought on staff at, at that church and that church kind of split. And I went to a different church and went on staff there in Arkansas. And then when we moved to Tennessee, I got other work. I did other work and I've always had other businesses or other work that I would do. And then um, late in my Christian life, I got on, I went on staff at a different church in Tennessee, but a lot of those years I was just doing my own business or working a different job. Was it what you thought it was going to be when you finally got on staff? No. What was the, difference was it positive or negative negative 100 percent. it was politics it was control it was power it was yeah it was backroom conversations um it wasn't that these people were con men the pastors that i worked with it was that there was just so much that went on behind the scenes that didn't have anything to do with jesus or helping people it was all yeah. about putting on a show or making sure that the, the meetings were what they should be and building up the, the, the attendance and getting the tithe money in because it's a business. It's, it's the business right. of church. Yeah. And business of church is very, very unt- distasteful. Yeah. Do you remember an example of like a time or maybe the first time you were just like, whoa, this is not at all what I thought this was going to be? Um, yeah, there was a time I write about it in my book. Um, <clears throat> uh, the lady who ran the church that started the church where I was on staff 
had resigned and handed it over to my friend who was the pastor then, and I was the associate. But she kept working behind the scenes and manipulating things and trying to control things and influencing people against us and what we were trying to do. And it was just ugly. It was just like a tug of war of power. And yeah. it wasn't as much on me a, a drain, but it was my my friend Steve, who was the pastor. I was the associate. So he bore the brunt of it. And uh, I just saw that and just like, I, I, it's really it's really shocking that I went ahead and got in and got into any other kinds of ministry after that. But right. I did as I felt again that I was called to do it. And I, I enjoyed that part, the work of the ministry that dealt with the people and with the teaching that I did, but the politics of it was very uncomfortable for me. Yeah. And, and I remember that feeling where you're like, well, maybe a different church is what I need. Well, maybe a different, yeah. you know, maybe it's not working out here, but it'll work out somewhere else. Um, and so on your website, uh, there was a statement that I was just curious uh, about the background here. It said, following several years of internal struggle, Dave came to the conclusion in 2011 that he no longer believed in a personal God. What were those internal struggles that had that profound impact on you? Because that seems like, I mean, you were religious for decades. Like what what would happen that would make you question that or change that? Well, I was I went on staff at this church in Tennessee, a big Kind of a mega church and they put yeah. me in charge of satellite congregation and i was doing real really well with that and um uh god was blessing it I, actually um and it was growing and people loved my ministry and but the senior pastor of that of that church was really um kind of a control freak and narcissistic and he and i just didn't mesh well after a while um and so he ended up it came to a head where I was either going to quit or be fired. And I decided I would just let him fire me. That way I would get some severance pay because I really didn't, didn't know what I would do after that. Um, right. So he, he did fire me and it caused quite a, a stir in the church. Um, like hundreds of people left and I was accused of splitting the church and it went from like 1500 to about 800 overnight. And wow. My two daughters were uh, married to men who were in the student intern program at that church. And he really he essentially turned them against me and and they shunned me and my wife. Um, and I was still a Christian at that time. Yeah. So I was really crying out for help from the, the denomination, from other local churches, pastors that I was friends with and and from God. And I realized after a while that God wasn't helping me with the, with my own family, and I was trying to serve him. And then I thought, you know what? Has he ever really helped me? Has he ever really been there? I started looking back through the events of my life and recognizing that he just really never quite showed up in the way that I expected him to. So I started examining my my own personal history with the church, my own personal history with my faith, with the Bible, and and these expectations of God that I had where, where he wasn't showing up to. And were these expectations realistic? And as I looked at the Bible, I said, yeah, according to the Bible, they are. You know, the answer to prayer, the things that Jesus said about prayer, the things that Jesus said about being with you and helping you and guiding you. And I just realized after about a year and a half of really examining all of that, uh, that he'd never really been there. And I'd been doing it all myself. And the Bible was just a man-made document. And I realized that I'd been fooled and it was I was wrong all those years. And I just came to the painful conclusion that it wasn't real. It wasn't true. And I didn't I no longer believed it. Yeah. And I really want to highlight something you just said. You said the painful truth, because. I think there's this stereotype that is on people who are no longer religious or they're agnostic or atheist where it's this big party. It's this big like, oh, yeah. yay, yeah. I'm free. God is dumb, blah, blah, blah. But there's a mourning process. There's like a real pain there when you realize yeah. that everything that was supposed to be true, you can no longer convince yourself is true. And it's it's 
so sad. It's really debilitating. And, and I've seen some people literally go into mourning over it. Oh, yeah. Um, Depression. And yeah. 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 And did that impact you for a long time or was it, were you able to pick yourself back up pretty quickly? Um, I imagine that didn't help your marriage probably. No, it didn't survive that. Uh, I stayed in it for another few years, but it didn't survive. And, um, and uh, yeah, it affected me a, a, a great deal because I, I didn't know anyone, not a, not a single person that I could talk to about it that wasn't a Christian. And that wasn't helpful. Um, I found some people online and, and that's when I started realizing that I wasn't alone. But it was a, a process of a year or two where I felt very disoriented and unsure of who I was and sad and angry alternately. Um, but I, I just didn't know what to do next. And it, there wasn't a, a celebration of that. I didn't no. want to lose my faith. It was something that I, it, I like to say it wasn't something I chose to do. It was something that happened to me. Yeah. It wasn't a, a decision I made. It right. Was, it was a conclusion I came to. Right. And once I did, I couldn't go back. It wasn't, exactly. Once it you see it, you can't unsee it. No. And that's what my kids didn't understand. And my friends didn't understand. Uh, my two daughters uh, cut me off for quite a while after that. Um, and it was just, I, I tried to explain to people, this is nothing I can choose to undo. This is not. I can't change this. Right. I can't just live a life lying to myself every day when I know that's not how I feel or that's not the truth. Yeah. Interesting. And so how do you go from mourning this loss of your life and your path and like having no idea what you're going to do with your life to being somebody who is, is speaking at conferences and writing books and being on podcasts and, and parts of like atheist YouTube channels and things like that. How did you become this version of Dave? Well, that's that's the other part of the story. Um, I didn't for a long time. I just came to the end of my faith. I found a community of people in Nashville that had experienced similar things. I was a member of the clergy project, still am, um, which is former clergy who no longer believe. Um, and I started building a, a, a different life. I left the marriage and just was an atheist who no, no longer believed you know, I had a community that I was a part of, but I wasn't doing what you'd call activism. Um, I didn't even go to very many conferences. Um, and when I did, I just kind of hung out and talked to people that I'd met there or my yeah. friends went with me. Uh, it wasn't until I was diagnosed with ALS <coughs> four years ago. And that's why my voice is raspy. Sorry, when I talk a lot, it gets uh, weak. Um, when I was diagnosed with this disease and realized I didn't, you know, it's terminal and there's nothing I can do. It's going to take it. It's going to take me out. I started speaking out about things, about living and dying as an atheist. And the dying out loud message kind of sprang out of that. Yeah. I started uh, speaking on podcasts and YouTube shows and traveling to secular groups and conferences to speak. And it just kind of organically, um, snowballed if you will until i be you know just uh, more and more people started hearing about it and reaching out and asking me to come speak here and come on this show and do this show and then i um you know a couple of years ago i did my own show for a year and a half and even just last night we started a new show on uh the line the channel called the line i heard about that yeah with jimmy snow and those guys uh -huh called dying out loud if we had our premiere show last night and i just feel like it it was one of those things that i felt like i needed to do to speak out with the time i had left um to make a difference and to do something that was valuable more than just me traveling as much as i could i started doing that but then i thought i need to do something a little more meaningful than than just checking off bucket list moments which is important as, as well and i've done those too yeah, And that's part of what our organization is going to provide to people diagnosed with ALS to give them bucket list moments. But so that's when I became active, as it were. And people like you hear about me because I just didn't do that for for quite a while uh, up until about four years ago. What would you say is 
in your opinion, the most important thing that you can say to people or that you want people to take from your speeches and presentations and messages if you had to have like a, a, a what's the word I'm looking for, like a shirt emblazoned with something specific that you want to be remembered for? Um, we have one life and that's it. And it's all about the moments contained therein. And if you don't like the life you're living, the story you're writing, then it's up to you to change it. There's no one that's responsible for it besides you. There's no one you have to answer to besides yourself. So make sure you're writing the story you want to write within the life that, that you have to live. That's it. And, and, and that's all there is. Because mm -hmm. when we talk about meaning and purpose, that's how you make meaning and purpose. Not, not from something someone gives you but yeah. something to create from within yourself. Would you say that your year spent in the church taught you a lot? Or if you could go back, would you undo those? Or do you think they helped make you who you are currently? I think everything we live in life makes us who we are and contributes to the person we become. If we, if we learn from it and grow from it and don't become bitter or angry. Um, I don't have regrets. Um, yeah. That, that's a very costly emotion. Too um, costly, yeah. It is. And I like what Maya Angelou said. She said, do the best you can do until you know better. And when <laughs> yeah. you know better, do better. Exactly. That is so simple and so profound. And so I look at my life at church, my life as a Christian, and I, I, I realized I was doing what I thought was better then. I thought I was doing the best. Yeah. And then I came to the conclusion that's, not true and now i'm changing and doing better i think and that's why the the book i wrote memoir the memoir is called childish things there's a scripture in corinthians it says when you become a man you put away childish things and that's what i feel like my deconstruction was i i, yeah. I, grew up, I, I put away childish things and so uh, i think it helped me in terms of how to uh interact with people. I'm a very social person. So my years in church ministry and dealing with people in that way helped me to have empathy for people, helped me to understand their journeys. Um, and so now with the work I'm doing, I'm, I'm able to connect with, I think maybe more kinds of people than some do. And with the speaking I do, it's something that comes easy for me. I don't, you know, it's just, a thing that I've done for so long that I can stand up and, and talk and connect with a, a room full of people. And, and it, it, it's meaningful and oftentimes powerful. And um, I think that as much as anything else is attributable to my experience with pastoral ministry and connecting with people over the years. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also, uh, a lot of the experiences we have that we wouldn't necessarily repeat again are, I'm grateful for a lot of things that I wish I hadn't done, but I'm glad they're over. I'm glad I'm through it and I'm on the other side because of who, like how it helped shape me into who I am and the, the way that I am. And I feel like I wouldn't be the same person without those experiences. You could not pay me to relive it. <laughs> you could not pay me to relive those years, but like the, I'm grateful that they happened and I'm grateful that I am who I am on this side of those experiences and then I've learned from them and then hopefully can, you know, teach other people based on those so they don't have to go through the same thing. Um, what would you say have been some of your favorite experiences you've had since your diagnosis and since you've decided to kind of speak out more and get more involved? Well, there's, they're, they're two faceted. Um, the, on the one hand, I've had some incredible bucket list moments. Uh, my partner Bevan and I have been able to go places and do things. We got to go to Greece and wow. experience uh, that. She'd been there before and really wanted me to share that with her. And it was a pivotal moment because I was getting weaker. And it was like, if we didn't go, we went last summer. And if we didn't make it last summer, we probably weren't going to make it. And so we were able to do that. We did things like helicopter over the Grand Canyon and uh, went skydiving. And the most recent thing was the scuba diving trip we took in in Hawaii that a, a group provided for us, a bucket list group, 
and a foundation gave us that. And so uh, contained in that experience was a chance to actually play with an octopus in the wild in, in the Pacific. That's cool. And have me, have him wrap around my arm for 15, 20 minutes and just, we had an uh, incredible experience, the octopus and I. At least I did. He may have been terrorized. <laughs> have you seen My Octopus Teacher on yeah. Netflix? Yeah. I feel like you'd like that. Yeah. And did you write your book prior to your diagnosis? or? Oh, no, after? no. It, um, the book only was released uh, last February, so it's been out uh, about a year and a half. Um, and, it, you know, I, I was going to write a book before the diagnosis, but when that came, I really realized... I have to now because it, the last part of it deals with me learning I have ALS and and uh, how my life pivoted at that point and how we began doing Dying Out Loud at that point. And then we would kind of leave it there. <laughs> so, yeah, the other part of what I would consider important moments since the diagnosis is just that experience of connecting with people uh, in my dying out loud activism, not, not only getting to travel and see them in person, but just hearing from people all over the world, literally, who've seen me on shows and heard me on shows and have taken some kind of inspiration from my message and it's been impactful to them. And I've gotten messages from people that that my speaking out about stuff has has made a difference for them and that's really priceless to me absolutely and the the irony of it i never would have been doing this and they would have never heard from me or of me you would have never known who i am sydney if i'd not gotten diagnosed with als right that's that's a paradox that makes no sense but it's true very much and it's almost like it's almost like it was something that kind of, do you feel like it catapulted a, like a new version of you in a way? Or do you think it catapulted, like you said, you'd always write, wanted to write a book, but now you felt like you needed to faster. Do you feel like it just kind of expedited who you are? Or do you feel like it's totally changed you since even before your diagnosis? Yeah, it, it made me um, more focused and it, it amplified um my efforts to do something different and make make a difference, so to speak. I, I wouldn't call it like trying to leave a legacy kind of thing, but just that I, I don't have a lot of time here and I've got to be vigilant with, with what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and, and focused on it. And it, it does narrow your focus. And it also gives you a bit of, when you have a terminal disease and you're speaking about dying, and living and and purpose and meaning, it gives you a bit of a megaphone that regular folks just don't have. For whatever reason, people are gonna pay a little more attention to a guy who talks about dying, who's actually dying. It's not a theory for me. Right. And so it gives me a, a platform that that many don't have that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah. <clears throat> absolutely and i feel like it probably gives volume to that platform as well like it, the reach there is immense i'm sure um what's like what is a message you've gotten from somebody that it was very memorable to you where you were just like wow this is just shocking oh man i've actually compiled a list of them i'm, I'm yeah. gonna use some of them in my next book i'm working on um one of the first ones i got that, um, well, one of them that I got was funny in a way because we, we, we have a merch store now, but we didn't at first because we didn't plan any of this. There was no right. marketing, team, no development team. It just happened organically. And I got a message from a guy out in Oregon. Um, we we talk, started talking about a thing called What Would Dave Do? Because in a meeting, it's I talk about it in the book, uh, a meeting that we were having in our community in Nashville. And um, one of the, my friends there, short, it was a very emotional meeting. It was a couple of weeks after my diagnosis and everybody was still processing it. And it was a feeling like, you know, I'm going to die next month kind of thing. It was, yeah. 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 It was this heaviness. 
Because yeah. with ALS, you just don't know. Right. And she was talking about, I'm getting gas last week and running errands. And I was flustered and frustrated about stuff. And she said, why, why am I? And she caught herself and said, why am I so easily frustrated when Dave is dying? He wouldn't be all upset about this. What's wrong with me? And then someone said, yeah, what would Dave do? And so and we said, WWDD bracelets. So we started doing, what would Dave do bracelets? And so we started talking about that. I did on some podcasts and stuff. Yeah. So this guy from Oregon, I'm sorry, long story, but. Um, no, I like it. I'm into the it. guy from Oregon sent me a letter and he's got a picture with it. And he says, I'm dealing with stage four cancer and it's pretty serious. But hearing from you has really inspired me to keep plugging and, and reaching for the moments and making the most of whatever time I have left. And he said, so I went online and got one of your shirts and he had a picture of himself out by a Creek with a shirt on that said, WWDD, what would Dave do? And I texted the lady who was acting as my manager. And I said, do we have shirts? <laughs> do we have t-shirts? She said, no, why? We said, well, some guy thinks he got one of our t-shirts. <laughs> and uh, turns out there's more than one Dave out there. <laughs> uh, knew. But he had gotten online and ordered some t-shirt. What would Dave do? And he thought it was one of ours. Um, That's really funny. But um, sadly, I think he's passed on since then because I haven't heard from him in a couple of years and I can't reach him. But he was motivated by what I was saying to, you know, it strengthened him in some way. And another impactful me message I got early on was from a lady who said that she um, came across a video of mine and she was had been suffering some, some severe depression and hadn't gotten out of the house in three years. Couldn't walk across the room without a cane. And um, something I said just really registered with her. And she, she said, I started binging every video and podcast of yours I could find. And, and she said, it just, it snapped in me. And I, she said, today I walked five miles and I've, my son says, what's gotten into you, mom? And, and she's just a different person, she said. Um, and so just, I started realizing, those are just a couple of examples that I started realizing that, that our words do have power and, yeah. and we can motivate people and inspire people just by what we say and how we say it. And it yeah. added a lot of gravitas to what I was doing. Absolutely. Is there anybody who is that for you, who when you're needing motivation or where you, you're needing like inspiration, you watch their stuff or you listen to their stuff? Ah, uh, that's a good question. I, you know, I've got, I've done so many of these interviews, Sydney, and I thought I'd been asked every question under the sun, but you win. I have not been asked that question. I am <laughs> the nosiest person who's ever interviewed you. No, it's just a great question. I have to really think who is, who has inspired me? Um, I, I think, I'm, I mean, it's a really just off the top of my head right now. It's my partner, Bevan, because she, we, we got together right at the, at the time I was getting diagnosed and our whole relationship has been flavored by that. And she, has put her life on hold to follow me around the world doing this stuff, doing these conferences and speaking here and there and everywhere, plus having to put her career on hold and her life to take care of me because um, I've, I've needed more and more care through the years. So I, I think she's probably the biggest inspiration just because her strength to take this on, you know, who, who would, who would do that? It's one thing that if you've got a husband that you've been married to for 20 years and he gets sick, yeah, of course you're going to be there for him. But to take, take it on with a guy who you've just met and fallen in love with and to take that kind of response, knowing with her medical background where this is going to go, right? This is not going to be pretty. And she knew it. And yet she wow. dove. And, and so, that's awesome. That's amazing. Kudos for her. That's wonderful. I feel like everybody should have somebody like that in their life. That's wonderful. Say what? 
I'm you'll meet me the- Lewis. Yeah, I hope so. I hope to have the pleasure. That's you amazing. Will. What a great answer. That's fantastic. And has this new like chapter that you've made in your life since being diagnosed, has that changed your relationship with people who knew you before, who knew the more religious you, maybe like relatives or anything like that? Yeah, it's it's affected them in different ways. Um, I lost most of my Christian friends when I deconstructed. Figured, um, yeah. Family members um, who connect with me somewhat um, d- in different ways, depending on their faith level and how comfortable they are with my atheism. Um, but yeah, it's it's affected them in in depending on how they view death. And I say that because the Christians view death in a different way than the atheists do. Definitely, death as a, as a uh, a stepping stone into eternity, or at least they say they do. And yet when you talk to them about it, they seem to be more afraid of it than we are. Right. Which is what I've learned in this four year process. But um, the, the atheists in my life and the friends that I have now who are non-believers, they've embraced it a lot more readily and, and have um, accepted it and come alongside me in it. And they're not afraid of it as much like my my Christian family, for the most part, just don't know how to talk about it, so they don't. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. don't. And and my atheist friends will just, what do you need? I'm there. Um, like we've got friends here now, one from Minnesota, one from Tennessee, to help us because Bevan had to have some surgery on her hip uh, from a running accident, a running oh. injury, and so nice. we had a friend who just left here from. Pennsylvania uh, this morning and two more came in to help care for Bevan and me. And then next week, two or come to uh, two more will come in one from California, another from Tennessee. These are all people that I've known only in the last few years as a non-believer. And, and they're the ones who are there for us. And that's yeah. not to say my family wouldn't, if I asked them, right? but they're not really offering. And that's the difference. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think um, I, I've said this a few times. It it says a lot more, I think, when someone who doesn't believe in God and doesn't believe in heaven or heaven points or reward afterward uh, is still kind and giving and caring and they sacrifice and they show right. you true kindness versus somebody who, you know, even if they're truly doing it to be kind, you know, they still are thinking about those you know, afterlife points that they're going to get or whatever the case may be. Um, There's a, there's a comfort in knowing that you can trust people and rely on people who don't think they're getting rewarded for it in any way. Exactly. Yep. Just doing it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. So what is your second book about? Is it about your journey with ALS since your last one kind of ends there? It kind of is. It's not really a sequel per se, but it's, I'm going to, it's going to be called Dying Out Loud. Probably my first book went through several name changes, but dying out loud subtitle is what dying taught me about living. And it's going to be kind of a more of a, I hate to use the word inspirational, but it would be in that genre. If you will, if you have to pick a genre, it'll be inspiration or or self-help again. I hate that term too, but it does describe more so what I'm talking about in terms of the things that I've been talking about the last four years. Uh, with my shows and traveling and speaking, the the messages I've gotten from people, the conversations, the people I've met, really what what dying taught me about living, and that's that's more. It's just in book form a lot of what I've been talking about. Anyway, you know yeah. what what are the important lessons in life? Absolutely. That's, that's wonderful. Do you have a, anybody who inspires you as a writer? Anybody who you're like, I like their style. I like their career trajectory, their memoirs. I've never really had a favorite author. Um, if we were talking about the, the classics, it's probably John Steinbeck, but um, I, I've always liked memoirs and biographies and stories. Um, yeah. I'm not much of a nonfiction reader. Right. It's just never been a thing, but I've always been drawn to memoirs. Um, yeah. And I was actually, uh, before Jesus interrupted my life, um, <laughs> how rude of him. I was, uh, 
I, I was going to be a writer. I, I had in high school aspired to be a sports writer, a journalist. Wow. And I had a couple of teachers that really, um, really inspired me to do that. One was a speech teacher who proclaimed loudly in a speech class one day when we were doing uh, speech impromptu speeches. Well, not impromptu, but subject. Uh, th th five like extemporaneous. Ago. Yes. And we were given a subject and had to do a speech on it. And he jumped up after mine and said, that's what I'm talking about. That's a speech, people. And I, it was the first time I'd received that kind of uh, praise and, and someone saying, I'm good at something. And then wow. my English teacher had told me that I'm a good writer and you should pursue writing. He, he really liked the stuff I'd written. <clears throat> and so, lo and behold, after I wrote this memoir, I um, looked up those two teachers to see if I could find them. I did find my English teacher. He ended up living 45 minutes from here in, in North Carolina. Wow. I reached out to him and I said, uh, you might be interested to know if I've written a memoir and you're in it. And uh, he reached back and he said, that sounds incredible. I'd love to see it. So we met up and had coffee a couple of times. And I took him a book after it got printed. And he's been really encouraging about about it, actually saying that it was really good. And uh, so it was it was fun to I signed the book and I said, see what you started. And uh, <laughs> he was really I mean, imagine being a teacher and 50 years later, almost one of your students writes a book and tells you that you inspired them to to, to do this. Can you imagine how that would feel? I can't. That would be wild. That I would think they got the wrong person. I'd be like, surely they're not talking about me. They're talking about somebody else. <laughs> like same name. That yeah, it was really cool connecting. Yeah, with them, but, I mean that was probably even cooler for him. You know, I think like so. yeah, that's he great. Really because really my next it. question was going to be if he ever got a copy. That's wonderful. Yep, he's got one. Yeah, and he was the was he the speech teacher? No, he was the English teacher. He was the English teacher. Yeah. Yep. Did the uh, did the speech teacher ever get you to try to do debate? <laughs> no, debate I, no, I, I did a speech competition that I got third place in in the regional. Um, That's cool. But I wasn't much of a debate. Oh, actually, I did a debate with a, a different class. I think I was in the ninth grade then, and we we each chose a political candidate and went to debate. You know, try to sway the class to our candidate. Um, that was fun. That sounds like fun. I feel like people, the people that I know who are a fan of memoirs were either in, also involved in like speech to some degree or debate to some degree. I was I was on both. I did debate for many years and I'm getting my MFA in creative nonfiction for memoir writing. But I feel like those are usually yeah. hand in hand. You're usually a good writer is usually a good communicator as well. That's really cool. So are you writing things now? Yeah. Yeah. I'm working on it. See where it good. goes. Good. Yeah. Maybe one day we'll have a short story anthology or something like that. Mm -hmm. But, um, well, if people wanted to find out more about you and, and your message and what you're doing or, or places where they could go to kind of continue uh, supporting, what, where would they go? I know you said um, I'm dying out loud.org. And then do you have like a, a personal website with a blog or anything like that where they can read more of your writing? Um, it's not a blog. DaveOutloud.org is my personal website and it it will contain like uh, a link to all my it's kind of a, a just an overview of who I am what I do uh, it, it'll it'll have a link to all the things I've done um, it's got your calendar on it too doesn't it it's got my calendar and it's got past archives of, of, of videos and speaking engagements and and podcasts and then there's just you know dozens and dozens of them so yeah if people want to get a sense of who i am and what my message is that's the best place to find that as far as the organization i'm dying out loud.org is is the new thing that we're doing yeah and buy your book too i feel like that's a good way to to get to know you a little bit better yeah, if you're really curious about my story that is it in great detail um I've gotten, I've been really pleased with it. The feedback I've gotten is, was really overwhelming. Uh, the people that have said over and over, you know, they couldn't put it down. It just was, you know, 
really drew him in. I, I think it really came off well as a story, and um, and it's all true. <laughs> well, you, it's been changed. You're like, well, names been changed. I like to think of memoirs as my version of events. <laughs> you read it knowing that that's what you're getting. I love David Sedaris. Do you ever read David Sedaris? Oh, I work? love David Sedaris, yeah. He's, he's like the inspiration of my whole life. The whole, you know when you're reading his stuff, you're getting his side of the story only, and you just need to go with it. You just need to take it as as fact. Um, well, I, I heard one writer say that uh, if someone objects to how you portrayed them in, in the book, in your book, then they should have behaved better. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly. I um, I I do stand up, and I posted a set once about my family, and my cousin saw it, and it, and there was a bit about his mom in there, and he messaged me on Facebook, and I thought he was gonna yell at me, and he's like, no, he's like, if she didn't want you to say that stuff, she shouldn't have done it. He's like, I didn't hear any lies, no lies were told. It's your version of your story, and that's it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dave, I, I want to be respectful of your time, but I really, really appreciate you taking your time to talk to me and, and answer my questions and give me your your wisdom and your stories. I've really, really enjoyed uh, speaking with you. And and now that I, I've heard your voice, I really want to read your book and see if I can hear your voice in that as well. Um, and I hope others do as well who are listening to this. Um, but if you had any advice for anybody who potentially is going through something similar to you or maybe somebody they love is going through that as well. Uh, what would you say to them in terms of moving forward? Well, you're not alone. Um, there are many, 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 many people who've gone through similar things. Everyone's story is a bit different, but there are a lot of similarities when we, when it comes to our faith journey um, and deconstructing that, if that's what you're doing, I would also recommend um reaching out and connecting with people who've done done that or are do, or people who are doing that. There's an organization called Recovering from Religion, which is a mm -hmm. great resource for people yes. that I, I like to refer them to. Um, but that's 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 the main thing is is to realize you're not crazy, you're not alone, and there's other people that are right alongside with you. Almost any at uh, whatever point you're in on the journey, there's almost certainly someone around you that's right there with you. Right. Absolutely. So just fine. Absolutely. Well, Dave, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. And um, I will link everything that you mentioned, your book, Dave Out Loud. Um, I'm even going to put a link to your merch because I saw your merch yesterday. Um, Recovering from religion, everything we've talked about, I'll link in the show notes. Um, and then I'll send you direct links to your episode as soon as it goes live. Awesome. <laughs>